So we will have a talk on managed stream processing through Beam at LinkedIn. And we have these gentlemen right here. Yeah. Thanks and take it away. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having us today. Greetings from the streaming processing infra team from LinkedIn. Sorry, we couldn't attend the Beam Summit in person. Hope you are all having fun in New York. Today, we are going to spend the next 30 minutes diving into our journey of building a managed streaming processing platform using Apache B at LinkedIn. So first of all, please allow me to introduce myself and also my colleagues and co-presenters of today's talk. I'm Bing Feng, and I am an engineering manager of the streaming processing infra team at LinkedIn. Pratik and Xin Yu, could you say hi and just introduce yourself? Hey everyone, I'm Pratik, and I'm an engineer on the stream processing infra at LinkedIn. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Xin Yu. I'm working with the streaming infra team at LinkedIn, so I'm also an Apache Beam committer. All right, thank you, Pratik and Xin Yu. So here's the agenda of our talk today. I will start with why we decided to build a managed streaming processing platform, Managed Beam, and then Xin Yu and Pratik will dive deeper into the cool features we have been building for this platform. Lastly, I will share some of our insights and the lessons we have learned from operating Magic Beam by real production use case. Without further ado, let's kick things off with the why behind the Magic Beam. So what is our current state of play at LinkedIn when it comes to streaming processing infra or offerings? We are using Apache Beam as the cutting edge data processing programming model for both stream and batch. And under the hood, we run streaming pipelines with Apache Samza, a scalable and performant streaming processing engine we have built and open sourced at LinkedIn. As of now, Beam plus Samza is our main streaming processing framework, processing over 4 trillion messages per day with more than 10 pipelines in production and they support a wide array of business use case. From real-time machine learning feature platform, standardization, tracking to notification and ending builds platform. So for instance, to give you an example, LinkedIn's notification platform drives our user sessions and engagement by generating original or derived notification content, pinpointing target audience, and then ensuring timely and relevant distribution. And that is built on Beam Samza framework. So with all these success stories, why did we want to build Managed Beam, a managed platform for streaming processing, and what does the managing mean exactly? So sometimes we have to say, building and operating 24 seven running streaming processing pipelines can be tough for some users. We have heard time and again from our users, especially machine learning engineers, that they were unable to invest the hours and sweat it takes to build, test, and stabilize streaming jobs for their business needs. Sometimes it could take a team one to two months just to get a streaming processing job to production. Regardless, they also need to maintain and operate these jobs going forward. Also, as the infra team, We've also got our own challenges when it comes to offering and operating streaming jobs in production. Things like, how do we empower every LinkedIn engineer to easily create streaming processing jobs for their business needs? And how do we streamline the long process to roll out framework upgrades or new versions to all running jobs in production and manage the heavy uncle workload? So with all these challenges in mind, we built Managed Beam. It's a fully managed streaming processing solution through Apache Beam, enabling users to create and operate streaming applications both quickly and easily. Our ultimate goal as an infra and platform team is to let users easily craft their streaming processing application, focusing only on Beam's logic. Then they can step back as the managed beam platform could take over the operations through automation tools and uh, our infra foundations. 
and keeping all applications running smoothly 24 7 without any lag. Here is a high level diagram of our, of our mounted beam platform. I will give a very quick intro, high level intro first, and then show you in particular share more details. From left to right, first, the author insurance by Apache B. We build workflow components serving as ready to use building blocks to compose spin pipelines and on top of being P transforms. Secondly, Team 2 Plan. The central man uh, management platform with dashboard, deployment service, and a suite of admin tools. Third, runtime engine and beam portability. We use beam portability framework to provide a clear separation or isolation between user logic and the framework, allowing both to evolve and operate independently. And finally, operation and authorizing a set of tools that automatically tune BIM application resources and troubleshoot health issues for stability and cost efficiency. Okay, next I will hand it over to Xin Yu and Pratik to share more details of the managed BIM features. Xin Yu, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Bing, for the introduction. So now let's take a look at the key features uh, for our managed BIM solution. Okay, so as Bing already said, so there's a four main uh, components or thing, main key features we have for managed beam solution. So when users actually start to compose their pipeline, we offer a predefined set of workflow components. So those workflow components can help linking users to create their pipelines as fast as they can, and also be able to achieve uh, the, especially the special workflow they want to have. And next, compute isolation. So we use a uh, beam portability to isolate the in runtime, uh, the execution of user code and framework code. So we can do a better job about troubleshooting errors and find out uh, like scaling issues. And for management, uh, we have our own control plane, uh, trying to deploy the job and trying to monitor the job. And finally, we have operational support, uh, which use our own autosizer uh, to help the job scale as much as they can. So uh, let's take a deeper look at the, the workflow components uh, for user authoring. So these workflow components are built on top of being P-transforms. Uh, they are also implemented as a just standard P-transforms. So we offer a set of standard components, as you can see on the right-hand side. So these standard components range from uh, con like consuming from a source and dumping data into sync, and also standard data manipulations like filter projections. And also we offer a little bit complex uh, data transformations like drawing with a table or doing some window aggregation. So these are the standard ones. On top of standard ones, we also build uh, some domain specific components for, uh, for specific user flows. Uh, for example, for AI flows, we build uh, machine learning kind of components. Uh, this is like, uh, <clears throat> we have two examples here. Uh, one is for uh, model inference, which the user can choose a version of the model with some configs, and then we'll actually uh, trying to do model scoring uh, running uh, in our Samba processor. And the other component we have is called a feature fetcher. Uh, we'll allow user to use this component uh, to fetch specific features from LinkedIn feature store. So these common components plus the specific components helps users from different domains to build their pipelines. Uh, although the implementation of these components are using standard P-transforms, uh, the API actually we are trying to get into uh, like two aspects or two features of API, which is a uh, language neutral. So user can use it uh, in different uh, language, for example, Java, Python, or uh, some DSL. And also we want to be runtime, runtime agnostic. So these components API doesn't have any Beam uh, API inside. So meaning we can translate into being P transforms and also down the road, if we want to use SQL, we can also use that. So uh, these are actually a uh, example of how we define the API of these workflow components in portal above. Uh, as you can see, uh, these are like the, these are more like a kind of example cases. So it is kind of uh, abstracted out. So for example, the source component here, uh, we have uh, two kinds of sources. Uh, there are a Kafka source, uh, which you can use it to consume from Kafka topic. 
And there's also Brooklyn source. Uh, Brooklyn is LinkedIn's in-house uh, change, uh, change capture stream. So user can use that to consume and change capture streams. And also there are sync components and also there are examples of uh, some projection components. Basically user can define expression uh, for the project fields and we can use that uh, to extract all the fields user want. And there's also uh, an inference component uh, which user can use to do more inference given a model config. So after the user uh, compose their pipeline use workflow components, uh, when we run the user pipeline, we use Beam portability uh, to help us isolate the runtime of user code and framework code. Uh, the goal for us, for we call this product compute isolation, and the goal for this compute isolation is to uh, have, basically we can upgrade framework versions uh, whenever we want to like have a like new release or have a bug fixes. So without uh, interfering user pipelines or user development cycles. And also we should be able to uh, troubleshooting and triaging errors based on the user process and the, the, the framework process. Uh, as you can see, the implementation is mostly uh, doing on top of being portability, portability framework. Uh, a more detailed version is here. So uh, on the right hand figure, uh, you can see the whole flow of uh, this uh, compute isolation uh, process. So when we package uh, the user, uh, when we package a pipeline, we package the user pipeline and the framework uh, jars into different artifacts. And our control plane could uh, smartly uh, decide which framework uh, version to use and then pull different framework artifacts based on that. And all the framework jars and uh, the user jars will be uh, grouped together and distributed to our young cluster. And in our, one of the Samza container, will run the user class pass and the framework class pass in different processes. And then you see this is mostly based on being portability framework. So we have the runner run in one process and UDF run in a process. So we have isolation of whatever the user logic versus runner logic. And as you can see, we also achieved uh, like ease of troubleshooting by have a different matrix of user process framework process and the log separation of different processes. And this framework also allow us to support multiple language APIs. So we can actually have uh, use user code either in Java or in Python. So that way we can uh, do the same actually to manage and scale and troubleshoot uh, different UDFs. Next, I'm going to turn to Patik to tell you the next key features of managed beam solutions. Um, next, I'll talk about some of the infrastructure we've built to simplify management and operations for the managed beam offering. So the first major piece is the control plane that makes it easy to manage stream processing applications, both for users and for ourselves as platform operators. Uh, this control plane includes operational dashboards, admin tools, uh, REST APIs for job metadata and control, for example, deployments and a bunch of automated job management, job lifecycle management features. For example, automatically setting up monitoring and logging dashboards, automatically provisioning resources and ACLs for new applications, et cetera. This control plane is the central point of interaction for users, or platform operators, that's us, and platform services to interact with the rest of the platform. Uh, and it provides a consistent user experience, abstracting away any differences in the underlying API. For example, we run both Beam and SQL at LinkedIn. Underlying engines, we run both Samza and Flink, and the runtime environment, we run both Yarn and Kubernetes. And you can imagine if users had to be aware of the details of each of these combinations, it would be pretty complicated for them to build and manage pipelines, but the control plane abstracts away all of that. For example, uh, this is the, this is a, uh, like a, this is part of our stream processing dashboard at LinkedIn, operational dashboard, and we show a variety of runtime information about the application. Uh, for example, configs, their execution model, auto sizing actions, diagnostics, et cetera. I'll talk a little bit more about those next. So speaking of auto sizing, we've built a lot of infrastructure to automate and streamline operations for stream processing applications, without which it wouldn't have been possible for us to manage applications on users' behalf. Uh, and one of the most critical pieces is an, auto, is an auto sizer that automatically tunes application resource for, for them. And as you guys have probably all built and operated stream processing applications, that can be a pretty time consuming and uh, challenging exercise for users requiring a deep knowledge of the system. An auto sizer abstracts away all of that. 
So the high-level goals for this autosizer are first to ensure that there are no failures or processing backlog due to resource exhaustion. Uh, for example, there should be no out-of-memory errors or CPU throttling for applications at runtime. Second, to reduce onboarding time for new applications by automatically right-sizing them. As Bing mentioned, it can take up to a couple of months for app like users sometimes to launch new applications because they have to first learn Beam and they have to then learn the engine internals to know what to tune. And Autosizer takes away a lot of that complexity by automating the tuning and stabilization. And finally, as a almost as a side effect, uh, it improves cluster utilization by preventing and correcting any oversizing because sometimes users just oversize applications just to get them stable and running. Uh, and this is a fairly complex system. Um, and we've designed this with a few general overarching principles. So first and foremost, because the system interacts with user applications, uh, it needs to minimize any disruption to the applications due to sizing actions. Uh, this could mean don't size applications too often or don't size them up or down if you're not confident about the decision. Secondly, any scale-ups need to be safe, which is fairly obvious, uh, but there are many implications of this. For example, any remote services being called by the application must not be overwhelmed when we scale them up because now they're doing more throughput and making more remote calls. Similarly, we need to be mindful of cluster capacity uh, so that the cluster capacity overall does not get exhausted due to sizing action and affect other applications in the cluster. So we need checks and balances like this for the auto sizing system. As a counterpart to this, the scale down also needs to be safe. Uh, for example, by design, the autosizer is more conservative with scale downs and pretty aggressive with scale ups because our goal is to stabilize things first and then, as a side effect, optimize things later. Uh, we want to really avoid false positives for scale downs. Another interesting observation is the autosizer needs to minimize or remove flip flops between consecutive scale up and scale down actions. For example, you've seen daily, as LinkedIn is a social network, we have daily traffic variation depending on when users are logging in and using the system. And Autosizer needs to be smart enough to not scale up and scale down apps continuously because that causes uh, downtime for them. And last but not the least, any tuning actions by the Autosizer need to be interpretable by users and operators. So we can explain why it did certain things and we can observe and improve the system itself based on if we believe that action was not appropriate. So at a very high level, the Autosizer is an iterative feedback control loop. Uh, it collects diagnostic information about the application or determines the appropriate sizing actions based on rules-based policies and applies the actions through the control plane that I talked about earlier. And to dig in a, dive in a little bit deeper, uh, this is a slightly more zoomed in view of the system. On the top left, you can see a couple of applications. The applications self-report diagnostic information about themselves, for example, metrics or any interesting events like deployments uh, through Kafka topics or streaming topics. And below that, you can see a few out-of-band monitors for applications and the clusters, which provide autosizer information about the hard failures, in which case applications wouldn't have been able to report it themselves, and any processing lag measured out of the band from the applications. In the middle, the diagnostic preprocessor, which is part of the autosizing system, preprocesses all of this information, repartitions it, merges it, generally prepares it for the autosizing controller to take actions. This raw data, the raw inputs, are also sent to our OLAP store, which is Apache Pino at LinkedIn, uh, for further analytics and uh, improvements. And I'll talk about it in a, in a minute. The auto sizing controller on the middle right receives all of this data. That's the brain of the auto sizing system. It periodically evaluates all of its policies for all of the jobs based on the data it has collected so far and based on time windows over this data and generates and applies any generated actions through the control plane. Uh, and the control plane makes changes to the application. It also sends any generated actions to the OLAP store, again, for analytics. So the OLAP store is used to both serve this information on our operational dashboards, the one I showed you earlier, and also for monitoring SLOs, generating SLO reports, and improving the autosizer behavior. And here's, for example, what, what the autosizer being in action looks like uh, from a user perspective. Uh, this is an example, if you read from bottoms up, uh, it's reverse cron sorted. Uh, the autosizer iteratively acts upon a new application and stabilizes it quickly, uh, starting from a default 1 GB uh, memory, uh, like slightly less than that heap and one uh, virtual CP core, and taking it up to like 5 GB memory and 2 GB heap uh, within like a few hours. 
And then after that, it has been running stably. So it, it hugely reduces the time to onboard new applications. Previously, this would have required a lot of manual iteration, trial and error, and also a deep knowledge of the system for what tunables to tune and what metrics to observe. And it automates all of that. So in addition to the auto sizer, we spent a lot of talk, talk, time talking about the auto sizer, but there are a few other important components in the runtime intelligence platform. For example, we have a diagnostic system, and you saw parts of that in the auto sizer architecture that surfaces errors, their root cause, and overall error statistics for applications on the operational dashboard. So users can easily know what's wrong. Uh, we, are, we also have a cluster load balancer uh, that uh, prevents hot host and noisy neighbor issues by proactively moving containers off of busy hosts. It observes the hosts themselves and then lo load balances them. And, the, and we also have a system that automatically restarts applications that have failed or stopped processing just to uh, keep them running stably. And all of these tools and uh, features of the platform together help us operate a managed stream processing platform at LinkedIn effectively. Yeah. And Bing will talk more about this platform offering at LinkedIn next. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Patrick and Shivi, for the deep dive into how we build managed B at LinkedIn. So now let's unpack what does manage really mean from a user's perspective. So first off, managed B isn't just an infra framework or library we have been building. It's a platform product to offer a managed operation solution. So what does this product offer in terms of operation or managed operation and SLAs? We have this table or grid to categorize or provide optimal operation support and the SLA commitment to different use cases at LinkedIn. On the x-axis, we've got our operation offerings and the y-axis, we've got SLA theory. For operation, we have two offerings, managed application and a managed platform. So what is managed application? We provide application level operation and on-call support for them, for this category, which means we commit application running nonstop without a leg, seamlessly scaling up and down by our outsider. As for managed platform, we provide and maintain a stable platform and a cluster to allow users to build sophisticated applications with complex UDFs. For SRI tiering, it's pretty straightforward. We offer business armor support and also 24-7 support. So with this grid, we collaborate with our customers to figure out the best managed operation and also SRI solutions for them taking into account their business requirement, business impact, and also corresponding operational cost. So for example, we, we have teamed up with the machine learning infra team at LinkedIn to develop a real-time machine learning feature platform based on Mind B. So the left side is a high-level diagram of this system. By the overall, by the easy to use authoring, including workflow components and local testing, and also the, also the fully managed oper operation provided by Monday B, it's much easier for machine learning engineers to also streaming pipelines for real-time features. For instance, the time it takes to build, test, and stabilize our real-time feature generation pipelines has been reduced from months to just days. And also the runtime operational cost has dropped to almost zero for end user. We take over the operation. So actually my colleagues from LinkedIn will be giving a talk about this work at 2.30 PM tomorrow uh, in BIM Summit. If you are interested in learning more about how we built real-time machine learning feature platform with Monday Beam, be sure to check it out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that is our talk today. Uh, thank you for your time. And I will stop here and open the floor for Q&A. Thank you.